The world is changing. Here and now we are fighting a global pandemic, but the megatrends impacting humanity, like urbanization, new technologies, and the strive for a sustainable climate, they will still shape our future. A future that we at the Volvo Group will be part of creating, living up to our mission, driving prosperity through transport solutions. And today, we would like to share with you how to achieve this. So, welcome to the Volvo Group Capital Markets Day 2020. It will be a slightly different event, reflecting the very different world that we have around us. We will, of course, address our current performance, but the majority of the time will be spent on our transformation into new business models and new technologies. But let's start by looking back. We have, during the last five years, set goals and we have made promises to the market and our employees. Look at this. What we are now focusing on is uh, really putting uh, the next phase for the group. Um, customer focus is something that we will hear a lot about today and what does that mean in reality. Simplicity, I was into that. We are uh, pursuing a decentralization uh, with uh, full PL responsibility. Continuous improvement as the main driver for uh, uh, customer satisfaction, but uh, and as a consequence, uh, also uh, profitability improvements and organic growth. Uh, and mainly, then, as we see it uh, when it comes to. Uh, the untapped uh, potential on the service side, for example. Quality, 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 quality. Uh, yeah, because customers, they live and die with their brand. Quality, 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 <laughs> quality, quality. It feels like a century ago. <laughs> yeah, it does. Uh, in a way, it does, uh, Kina. Uh, but maybe the first uh, commenting that uh, most welcome from all our side also, uh, from my side to this Capital Market Day. Yeah, in a way it feels like uh, a decade or two ago, uh, but uh, at the same time it feels like uh, yesterday. I think we have been leaving those uh, prioritized areas for quite some years now, and uh, we have seen good achievements. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's interesting to see this uh, film. Mm. Uh, we stated a number of, of, of key objectives, mm. but going back, what was it that we really promised? At first, I think we promised to deliver on our promises. And, and that has been one of the most important factors, obviously, that uh, we are actually achieving results uh, step by step because we have a great organization and a great team. Uh, but if we are to highlight a number of areas where we have really stepped up and made uh, very good progress, it's the customer focus side, uh, how we are living the customer in the organization, of course, in our commercial organization. Uh, but also uh, throughout the value chain. I mean, sourcing, production, technology, and everyone is focusing on how do we actually accelerate that experience for the customer. And that is seen in the customer's satisfaction and how we are building relations. Uh, continuous improvement, mm -hmm. uh, product quality. Uh, we had a good starting point, but uh, we have had uh, uh, progress. That means that today we have the best product quality ever, uh, also in the area of fuel efficiency. Uh, we see that in um, uh, the area of uh, volume flexibility in our production also, but also in our service system and across the organization, that we are following the cycles in a, in a very good way. And then organic growth, uh, the service piece. Uh, we have uh, delivered on the promises to increase that share by both penetration of number of service contracts, but also what is even more important, the depth of engagement how is uh, those service const uh, contracts constituted, uh, both on financial services and on repair and maintenance? So uh, a number of uh, things uh, achieved by our uh, people and uh, our team. Yeah, quite a few, you mm. few in fact. Um, if we sort of go beyond the promises mm. and we look at more on the, on the big picture, mm. what are your reflections, Martin? Now, I mean, uh, often we talk about outcomes and what we want to achieve in terms of financial figures and in terms of productivity or customer satisfaction. But at the end of the day, this is all about uh, people and culture. Mm. And uh, I mean, we have always had a very strong Volvo Group culture, obviously. But we have really stepped up when it comes to the performance part of our culture. 
And I'm convinced, and when I listen to our colleagues, that uh, the decentralized organization taking the owner responsibility, a profit and loss uh, responsibility, accountability, but also empowerment, being really close to the customer, simplicity and speed, not waiting for the decisions. Uh, and obviously also that we are utilizing uh, the regional value chains in, in a very good way. So people and culture is the, the, the true achievement for all of us. Mm -hmm. and, and Jan, you and I, we have been part of this group for many years and I, I totally agree to what you're saying. It is a different and more forward-leaning culture today. What are your reflections? No, I think uh, I think Martin has said a lot of the things that are, that have uh, made this improvement. But I think a little bit to summarize it, I think what Martin talked about first is is really I think excelling on the basics. We talked about that very much. How, how is it really to go from the from the customer in terms of sales, uh, service, all the way through production, purchasing into R and D? Uh, if we excel only through these parts, uh, we will. We said we will become world class. Uh, and, and it's not only that each part should work well together, it's also that the whole exactly. chain, the way we work cross-functionally mm -hmm. is important. I think that is a, a great difference compared to a couple of years mm -hmm. ago. The other thing is, is obviously uh, mm -hmm. ways of working, uh, how we have created an another organization, how we have worked with decentralization, ownership in the organization, uh, values and so on, uh, this, this uh, uh, performance culture. I think th these are the two things that I think is a real di big difference compared to five years ago. Mm. Jan, give, give us your view. No, coming back to what, what Jan said around uh, Excel on the basics and the consistency of, of doing that, uh, to have the focus to go to job every day and actually do what you have to do in a good way and improve all the, all the time. I call that to be disgustingly disciplined <laughs> on the focus <laughs> and the execution, which I think is very impressive by, by the Volvo organization. And in a way, I mean, uh, to summarize that, I mean, uh, the unfortunate and very sad and difficult situation we are into now uh, in the midst of this global pandemic, it's also in a way the ultimate test of how your organization is working. And if you start uh, by looking at the performance in quarter three, uh, where all our business areas actually uh, produced black numbers during a very, very difficult situation, is for me a proof point of that this decentralized and uh, performance culture is working well. But most important, how our leaders and colleagues have been stepping forward and really making the right priorities in, in very difficult times. I mean, first and foremost, health and safety, for colleagues, business partners, customers. Secondly, the focus on the customer to keep up time for societal critical activities, while at the same time executing on, on costs uh, and cash protection in order to really preserve the maneuverability. That is really the proof point of a well-functioning uh, and high-performing uh, company. I'm so proud of what uh, all our colleagues have been doing here. Mm, I think we, we all share that. Um, Jan, uh, increasing our profitability, I mm. mean, that was, of course, one of our key objectives. Mm. Can you describe how our profity, profitability journey has developed mm. over time? Well, of course, uh, Keen, and you know it. I mean, uh, the financials is only a consequence of what we are doing and how we are doing it. And we have been talking about that. But of course, the journey, the stepwise improvement we have been doing now, uh, profitability-wise, and also on the operational side is very impressive and we have moved up our profitability level. And that is very important when we come into more of, of tough times. We are in a, a business that is very volume dependent. The underlying demand is critical for uh, the financial performance. To have that level coming into tougher times is crucial, but to have a strong, well-performing and rather uh, substantial service operation that is decisive for the resilience and for the financial maneuverability. And I think, as we have said, that we have been proving that uh, the last quarters both accelerate earnings and cash flow. And as we can see here, I mean, we were back uh, from a net cash position where we ended the year here uh, in September after three quarters of COVID-19 crisis management. But if we take a little longer perspective and take the 48 last month, uh, including then 2020, we have been generating 100 billion of cash flow in industrial operation. We have dividended out 
35 billion to shareholders, and we have also then increased our mm. cash with 65 billion during that, that time period. Extremely proud figures, and we should all be proud as a Volvo organization of that achievement because it's also very important for uh, future because that is the foundation that we will be able to deliver on our financial targets and we are as it is right now acting from a position of strength. Mm. Yeah, and it could be worth commenting uh, on that note also that uh, we have had uh, a view that we should have of course a balance between uh, good returns to our shareholders while at the same time investing for the future. And in the beginning of the year, as we uh, remember, uh, the board had also a proposal when it comes to the dividends for uh, 2020 related to 2019. And that was obviously both the underlying growth in the ordinary dividend, but also an extra dividend on top of that. Then the pandemic came and it was, uh, I mean, zero visibility during the second quarter. Where are we heading? And the board took a very responsible uh, stance, uh, saying we are postponing now uh, the, the, the returns uh, to preserve the maneuverability in the company. And that was also accepted by the AGM. Uh, but with this generation of 100 billions and then a dividend level of 35, of course, I mean, now the, the board starts to work for next year and coming up with a proposal in the beginning of, of next year for the AGM. Uh, so, so that I think is important. We had a proposal on the table responsible decision here uh, during a high crisis to preserve strong financial position that has served us really, really well here. Mm. And I think that is a message that many of our viewers uh, are truly appreciating mm. uh, to hear. I know that you have another beautiful slide up your sleeve, Jan. I have. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, wh when you are actually looking at this uh, and comparing with your peers, uh, be that on, on uh, the heavy vehicle side or on the construction equipment side, you can really see the journey we have been, the impressive journey we have been doing uh, in both heavy vehicles and in, in, in construction equipment. And it's not often that you can actually see this happening in a so short time frame in, in this industry. And of course, recognized by many, among others, uh, the credit institutes and the rating institutes. We have been upgraded in just a few years from triple B uh, flat and on the S&P scale up to single A minus. And we can also see that we have been sort of moving up one division mm -hmm. as relates to profitability, both in heavy vehicles and, and commercial equipment. And we are now fighting for the first position. And if we take a look on construction equipment, we already are there and we are then to defend our pool position as regard profitability. Mm. So we've talked about the what, Jan, let's develop on, on the how. How did we do this? I think, uh, I think everything starts by, by measuring what we do. And, and I think that was something that we did more and more. Uh, how is the profitability mm. on certain segments, certain variants, uh, products, markets? So we are aware of on where we make money, where we don't make money. And with that knowledge, I think everybody recognized that if there is something that is loss making, uh, what shall we do about it? So it's, it really starts with measuring. And, and then obviously we have, uh, I think now, one of my, my, <laughs> my favorite slides. I think it was introduced already in the Capital Markets Day in, in, in London. And uh, I can tell you, we'll, it is a, a, a slide about methodology. Mm. And it's not about what is on the red dots, the green <laughs> dots and the yellow dots. Uh, but I think it, it, it's really about that. And I think we've been working consistently with, that, with, this, uh, with this methodology in the organization. Uh, we can see a few examples on this. Uh, we have actually left some, some product areas. If you take backhaul loaders for Volvo CE and the medium duty trucks in Japan. Uh, furthermore, we have also, since I think we've been clearer on, on the truck side, Volvo Global brand and the other brands being more regional ones, we have also left some unprofitable markets for mainly for these regional brands. Uh, we have also looked into what is maybe not totally core in, in Volvo and divested them. I think the two best examples of that is probably um, wireless car, which is a new home. And, and what I hear is developing very well, which is obviously the best thing that can happen. But also the outsourcing of our uh, infrastructure IT operations to HCL. Uh, but it's not only about pruning the portfolio and uh, Absolutely. doing that. It's also about what can we invest in. And I think we, we have a few examples of that as well. Uh, quite recently, we have the fuel cell uh, joint venture with Daimler. An, an interesting thing that we are moving into right now. Uh, and, and furthermore, uh, <coughs> we, we, um, 
uh, we, we uh, also have our JVs in, in, in Asia that we are also putting more emphasis on. And not the least also Isuzu we own, uh, yeah. that is a strategic alliance of big importance. Mm, absolutely. So when it, when it comes to the more mm. kind of business development areas, Isuzu is definitely one. Mm. Uh, we also have the uh, Volvo uh, Autonomous mm. Solutions that you will hear more about before. So it, yes, it is pruning portfolio, but also what we put more emphasis on. Mm. Martin. No, I mean, uh, just to add a little bit what Jan talked about here, uh, of course, uh, this is also an important part of the performance culture. You have the operational part that we have discussed with continuous improvement, customer focus, organic growth, excelling on the basics, building up. But also to have good order in your portfolio is part of that. And uh, it is to measure, it is transparency, and it is about expectations because it's more fun to have that feeling that you own your business and you have the maneuverability to move forward. And what that has brought us to, and I remember that also, as you say, Johan, that it was a lot of discussion what are the red and, and, and the, the yellow and the green dots, etc. But the yellow dots, I think, is a good example. They could either be uh, long-lasting, uh, a little bit, you know, uh, average performing units with no growth. Okay, what should we do about it? Or it could be new units uh, that are just at the uh, start of their journey. Uh, the important thing is that there we have clarity, high frequency follow up and see that it's developing according to plan. That is bringing performance into the culture. And that portfolio has brought us also to a level now where, where we actually have a balanced portfolio. Uh, we talked about quarter three, everyone is performing. Uh, everyone can do better obviously, but performing good. Uh, we have the global scale where it matters, but we don't have scale where it don't matter because that is only bringing complexity. And that is the same with the market presence. So it has served us well in addition to the uh, operational performance. Mm, absolutely. And, and we can reveal uh, that it is exactly <laughs> the same slide that we showed in London some years ago. So there's uh, no need to sit no, down and try but to things have them. happened a lot here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jan, uh, a final slide that we would like to show our audience is the one on, on our financial, financial ambitions. Uh, do we dare to say that we have ticked the boxes now? I think we can dare to say that we have ticked uh, some of these boxes, yes. I think the starting point here was obvious that we were not satisfied with our financial uh, performance in, in the company. It was actually not where it should be for such a world-class company that Volvo is actually. Uh, so we had too low profitability uh, compared to peers and so on. Uh, and, and I would say as disturbing was obviously that we had too high volatility in, in our earnings as well. Uh, especially when markets were down, we, we fell much deeper than, than what competition did. Mm. Uh, and then also obviously maybe a little bit stricter uh, uh, allocation of, of, of our capital as well. Uh, so I think when we look upon it right now, with the things that Martin mentioned before, continuous improvement, how we can excel mm -hmm. on the basics, I think that has, uh, and with also organic growth, mm -hmm. that has lifted our mm -hmm. profitability uh, as you showed mm -hmm. before, Jan. Mm -hmm. uh, I think also now we are into a, a pretty difficult year, obviously, uh, we, with a pretty severe downturn, especially in the second quarter, but also in the third quarter, much lower revenues. And I think we are about to show now also that we, we have much less volatility in our earnings uh, compared to before. And I think we talked about the capital allocation before. So I think I dare to say that uh, we, are, we are there to tick these three boxes. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that we stand still. There's still room for improvement. I think this, when we talk about continuous mm -hmm. improvement, you never stand still. There are always things that, that you can, can improve. So even if we are proud about what we mm. achieved, mm. we will continue on that journey as well. Mm. But then uh, after I think it was one or two years, we, we added on the fourth um, mm. circle as well. Uh, we should probably should have from, had from the beginning, but uh, Martin, a few words on that. Uh, no, no, but I think, I mean, uh, the, the fourth circle, maybe we, we added that also because we really wanted to emphasize on the Excel on the basics and do things because everything about the future is based on credibility and what you do here and now. Uh, one of my old mentors always said that about your career. He said, I mean, Martin or whoever, you're not better than your, old, uh, your, or, uh, than your last job. And that is the same for us here. I, I think this is showing a good a balance of uh, what you as uh, investors should expect from us, what you should think about when you think about Volvo here and now, but also moving forward. This is about uh, performance from a position of strength, while at the same time transforming our industry uh, moving forward. Uh, so we are proud, but we are not satisfied. We will continue 
those are our promises from tomorrow as well. Mm. I think that was a very good conclusion. Proud but not satisfied. Um, thank you all. Jan, we will see you a little later on. But now it's time to dive straight into our transformation. The transformation of our industry and of the Volvo Group. Shaping the future of transportation. Take a look at this. The world is changing. In 2030, we will be 8 billion people, 5 billion of us living in cities, digital and connected, producing around 80% of the world's GDP, driving the need for transportation. There will be infrastructure demands, water, schools, hospitals, airports, an $8,000 billion investment needed by 2040. Not to mention more than $900 billion in roads annually. And infrastructure is in our DNA. E-commerce has become the largest retail channel in the world. Increasing the demand for uptime, high quality and reliability, a promise of same day delivery. It's a huge opportunity for growth. Soon, 80 billion devices will be connected via the internet, revolutionizing transportation and logistics. At the Volvo Group, we are shaping the future of transportation with solutions that are safer, cleaner and more productive than today's. That way, we can meet the growing need for transport while staying within the boundaries of what our planet can sustain. Driving prosperity through transport and infrastructure solutions. Eight billion people, 80 billion connected devices. I mean, it's hard to grasp these numbers. Now, it's mind-blowing, obviously, um, but it's also important for all of us to take a step back and think what will that mean for our industry, but also society at large. And uh, what it will mean for our industry is obvious. I mean, that will mean a lot of possibilities. And that's the reason why we are calling also the next decade for the golden era of logistics. Mm -hmm for many different reasons. And let me show you some of those reasons. Some of them you're of course aware of, uh, those mega trends that are driving the need of transportation. Uh, we always say that uh, transports are related to the development of GDP globally. And one very important trend is obviously the growing global population, not at least when it comes to emerging countries, that is driving the middle class in those countries to have a better development, and that is great, obviously. We also see that the rapid urbanization in all parts of the world, but primarily also in emerging countries with higher GDP growth, is also a very uh, decisive factor. And then obviously you have the new trends coming into play here, digitalization. We see that when it comes to the new technologies, the new societal demands of transparency, transparency and in particular uh, the emerging and very fast growing e-commerce. And that is effecti uh, uh, effectively one of the trends that we see are breaking the curve of transportation. Uh, so it's not only related to the GDP development. But we also know that this increased need of uh, transport in ton kilometers or in passenger kilometers must be done in a considerably more sustainable way. And that's the reason why the decarbonization, the sustainability story and the journey uh, forward is so important. And all these trends, and some more obviously, we have a number of other trends coming into play here, have been the backdrop of our discussion, how do we update, how do we reinforce our strategic framework? So Jan, what has been the starting point for us in that work? Yeah. I think the starting point for us is really that our strategy has served us well. And in the core of this, that tells everything about the, uh, about the culture in Volvo is the pyramid. Mm. And the pyramid actually is, is nothing new either. It's something that we launched already in 2016. Uh, and as you said, it, it tells everything about our, our culture. We talk about prosperity. And I think prosperity is a pretty wide word, but it is also forming the base for our sustainability work. And we will come back to that quite frequently in, the, in, the, in, in this event. Furthermore, to be a world leader in transport and infrastructure solutions, it's absolutely of the utmost importance to us. 
When we talk about our stakeholders, and here obviously we have different stakeholders, it is about our customers, employees, and obviously our shareholders. We make promises there as well to all of these stakeholders. We come further down in the base. Further down is ne not negative, it's actually the base of the whole thing. The platform. The platform. Then we come to our values and also how we behave as an organization, our code of conduct. So the values, I think that leads us into to the leadership and we want to have in this, in this group as well. And Martin. Absolutely. And I think that is a very important backdrop when we are talking about leadership because we need to have also a clear direction together. And when we have been talking about the performance culture in this group, uh, it has been serving us well so far but it will also continue to serve us well moving forward because that will mean further quicker interaction with our customers, with our sourcing partners, with the ecosystem. And thereby we need to continue to pursue the main things here. Decentralization in terms of profit and loss responsibility as we've been discussing, empowerment, the regional value chains is a key strength of the Volvo Group that we actually are pulling from the business areas where we have strengths from a global scale. It could be technology, logistics, it could be volumes in uh, different components, but still we are letting also the business areas act freely on what is bringing them success. And that is given them simplicity and speed and continuous improvement. So it is all about people, culture and leadership, and we have a strong base fitted for the future. Absolutely. Uh, I think in hindsight, it's always easy to explain what, is, what, has, what has happened in, in a company. I think it's important to reflect a little bit on it, where we come from. So if we start here, go back two decades, to the beginning of, of, uh, of, of this century, we were in a situation where, we're, when we're, where we were acquiring quite a lot of companies, and, and that has created a fantastic base for this, for this group, actually, uh, with the possibilities to have economies of scale, uh, you can say ge geographic reach and, and a lot of uh, interesting products and also customer base as well. Having done that, obviously, when you acquire a lot of companies, you get into complexity, you work a lot with integration, how can you combine platforms and that kind of work. And, and, and that obviously meant that we were struggling a little bit here, exactly mm -hmm. with the profitability. As we said before, we were not on the level that we wanted to be. It was absolutely necessary mm -hmm. to create the right cost base and a foundation for going forward. Since you can say around 2016, we, we continued the journey with improved performance based on organic growth, uh, but also working with, with, uh, uh, with what we said before, become more efficient along the value chain and created a solid platform for further steps to take. And that is also, we started to talk about it already one year ago, Martin, it was really about perform and transform. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think where we are today- I love the balance there. Perform the balance transform. is important. That's great. But I think it's important now, even though we started to talk about <laughs> it one year ago, it's really about now to step, step up and accelerate on, on the transform side. Absolutely. But we have the platform to do that. Mm -hmm. Then when it comes to, uh, you all have seen our seven strategic priorities. They have also served us well during the years. But where we are right now in the phase, uh, we said it's important for us to sit down and reflect. Is it necessary to do some changes or emphasize a few things? And, and we, we have actually a little bit uh, changed and revised our strategic uh, priorities. But I would say as important, if not more important, is to keep the foundation continue to drive what has taken us here. Uh, this one, you will have the possibility to read it uh, later on, but you will see a few things here that, that is absolutely the same, maybe worded a little bit different. But we have obviously the service business. Yeah, Martin, mm -hmm. you like that. Martin. I like <laughs> I it a lot that. as well. So <laughs> close to the customers. <laughs> absolutely. The service business, something that we will continue to, uh, to, to, to drive going forward. Obviously, the, the product and service portfolio needs to continue to be world-class. Uh, car system, uh, extremely important. Mm -hmm. We have on number four, we have Asia mm -hmm. as an important uh, area. I can see immediately that you will spot that we have also the United States there, where we see that we can improve our presence. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not 100% satisfied with mm -hmm. where we are there. Uh, when it comes to what we talked about before, continuous improvement and 
What is extremely important is also the Volvo production system, mm. something that has really helped us in, in, in driving the performance as well. So just to p that was just to pick a few mm. ones uh, that kind of shows the consistency that Absolutely. we are on. And Martin, what, what do you see as No, as no, but, but as you say, Jan, what I think is very important in this journey is that we have a foundation that is consistent, but still also developing those. We talked about, for example, the product and service portfolio here. And there we are talking about the same type of wording that we did before, a right product quality that we touched, uh, leverage the uh, new and well-known technologies through our modular system. But we have added a number of very important elements that will play a key role for us in our ability to transform this industry. That are partnerships, digital innovation and ele uh, accelerating electromobility. Another thing that is super important that you can take a look on on the balance here with the seven strategic priorities is of course also the, uh, the first uh, uh, priority here being an end-to-end -end integrator. And we will talk more about that during the Capital Markets Day. How do we integrate more into the customer's business in order to make the step change into electromobility or into autonomous solutions? And obviously, uh, scaling up new businesses. Uh, Melke Järnberg and Nils Jäger uh, will talk about that when it comes to autonomous solution as one example. So we really wanted to have the seven strategic priorities in the deck for you, so you can see the balance, where are we putting focus, where are we moving ahead here. Because it is about having a strategic framework based on the megatrends, it is about uh, having also uh, a consistent journey moving forward based on what we have achieved, but also the new reinforced areas. And then obviously talking about what do we really want to achieve, driving prosperity through transport solutions. And the only long-term ambitions you can have here when you're talking about uh, prosperity is to have solutions that are 100% safe, 100% fossil free, and 100% more productive. And the reason is very clear. First and foremost, when it comes to safety, up to even 2020, more than 1.3 million people dies in accidents related to road, transport, and infrastructure. And then you have to add on also when it comes to accidents related to off-road. And of course, we cannot have it like that. That is not the truly sustainable society. Secondly, when it comes to 100% fossil free, that is our promise to lead and to deliver on Paris and beyond. And finally, 100% more productive. That is the golden equation between planet, people, profit and prosperity. Because in order to get that, we know that transportation and infrastructure is driving prosperity, but it must be done in a considerably more sustainable way. So that is really our promise. And by doing that, Kina, yes. we have not only been formulating the way forward, but also very important uh, to talk about what we have achieved. And you are not uh, only one of my favorite <laughs> communications officer and also leading communication and public uh, relations in the group, but also actually leading and coordinating the sustainability agenda in the executive board and in the group. So can you take us through where we are and also what we have done so far? Thank you so much, Martin, for a very nice introduction. Uh, sustainability is not new to us. This has been an ongoing journey for many years. Environmental care has been uh, part of our core values since the 70s. We have a firm commitment to the goals of the Paris Agreement and the strive for a fossil-free future. Um, I would like to start by showing you two examples on how we are executing on our current CO2 reduction ambitions. Uh, and what you see on the screen right now is part of the outcome of our WWF partnership. On the left hand side, we have since 2013 been able to reduce the amount of CO2 per shipped volume in our own transport system by 18% and by 35% in our manufacturing operations. And these are high and impressive numbers that we are truly proud about. Yeah, I, I'm very impressed about that and, uh, and also about the engagement of all our people, how we are working with it in 
in an integrated way because it's good for the company, it's good for the climate and, and for society at large. But I think you are a little bit modest here uh, <laughs> b because, I mean, a lot of journeys started before. And, and here we see a, a picture of a beautiful uh, footprint that we have in Ghent. Mm. So can you lead us through that journey? Yes, uh, as a coincidence, we happen to have this wonderful picture. And this is, as Martin said, the Ghent factory. It was the first factory in the world to be CO2 neutral. And that was already back in 2007. But we are not stopping here. With our vision and with the Paris Agreement as our guiding stars, we have sustainability deeply rooted into our um, strategic foundation. And as some of you might have seen, this morning we announced that we are now committing to the science-based target initiative. And that is taking a step, step towards becoming a net zero emission company by 2050 at the very latest. We have had a second piece of news out this morning, and that is the fact that we're also now launching a green finance framework. And what is very positive to see there uh, is that we are directly qualifying as deep green in, in the rating here. And that is, of course, related to the fact that our type of operation, both our own operation, have a lot of great opportunities for green financing, but also the scoop three, how we are interacting with our customers when it comes to the journey to fossil free. So here is absolutely a partnership that we can do together with many of you. So stay tuned on that one. Mm, it's a great opportunity. And finally, I would like to, to mention TCFD uh, and also the sort of enforced implementation of this sustainability reporting framework. And, and why is that important? Well, it is important with transparency, regarding our strategy, our goals, and also the fulfillment of our objectives. It is about walking the talk. Absolutely, it is about walking the talk, and, and therefore also we have put up a clear direction moving forward now for the coming decade here. First and foremost, building on what Kina said, uh, we had already between 2013 and 2019 then reduced our footprint by 18% on our own logistics, but we would like to take a step forward here. We are one of the biggest uh, transport buyers also ourselves in Europe and actually in the world. And therefore we have said that uh, by 2025, we, had, we will lead by example with having the most sustainable transport and logistics system in the world. And that is good, of course, for our own execution, but it's also good to really test that our solutions are working in close connection with customers and partners. We are talking about 50% uh, of our revenues should come from services and solutions. And the reason why that has such a strong link with our sustainability journey is that our solutions will be more of a solution based over the life cycle. That we have a strong partnership in order to execute on electrification and autonomous. Uh, and that will bring us to fossil free uh, transportation, but it will also bring us to more resilience. Uh, more than 35% of our global shipments by 2030 uh, should be electric, both fuel cell and battery electric. We know that that is a bold statement, in particular if you, uh, as you understand also, that me will mean uh, considerably higher numbers when we are talking about uh, progressive regions like uh, Northern Europe or Europe as a total, but also main markets like China and, and North America. And finally, implementation of uh, 100 uh, solutions by 2025. And what do we mean about transport and infrastructure solutions then? Yeah, that we will hear more about during the day here, but that is really when we are talking about transport or infrastructure as a service over the complete life cycle. Exciting times ahead here. So with this as a backdrop, we are coming back to where we started with our ambitions. The long-term vision can only be one. And that is 100% safe, 100% fossil free, and 100% more productive to be the leader. So let's get started now talking about the journey towards fossil free and look at the roadmap ahead here. Here you see the roadmap of how we look upon the world when it comes to what we call the tailpipe emissions. What is emitted from the different vehicles or equipment. And if we start here, uh, by 2050, what we say is that in order to achieve and to lead Paris, we need to have a running fleet or a rolling population that is 100% fossil free at the latest, globally, by 2050. 
But that means also in reality for us that we need to ship 100% of our products and services as fossil free already from 2040. And why is it so? Yeah, because our products are running in different type of production systems and they are lasting for at least 10 years. So, th so that is the logic behind that. And then of course, as you see, it will be a gradual shift into electric here. And when we are talking about electric, that is of course both battery and fuel cell electric. And then of course also on the combustion engine side, even if that will decrease, also here we see how we are moving into fossil free when it comes to renewable fuels of biogas or even hydrogen. Often I get the question, what will happen if you do it and that is not happening on the grid or in the energy generation or in the infrastructure? Yes, we are a lot working with all these partners, but we will not use that as an excuse. We will deliver our part and we are confirmed by doing so that others will do the same. So, so this is really the roadmap that we believe in. Next step is to start the rolling out. And I can share with you some very exciting news here. Here you see what we call the fast paced introduction on the truck and bus side. A massive rollout uh, that has started. Here, for example, you see on the city bus side, a uh, hybrid experience 10 plus years ago, building into battery electric. We are in serious production when it comes to the medium duty. Uh, and that is serving important segments like distribution and waste and recycling. Now, in the coming years, and also urban construction. Uh, we did see, for example, the Norwegian Prime Minister inaugurating one of the urban construction vehicles uh, the other week here. Uh, and now, in the coming year and years, we are continuing to roll out that for all relevant segments, step by step. Uh, container haulage, heavy construction, regional haul, and then eventually also uh, the, the really heavy duty long haul that will be a combination of battery and fuel cell electric vehicles. And on the bottom, we are also reinforcing our capabilities and our offerings when it comes to energy services. So again, clear targets, clear roadmaps, and a clear rollout plan, Kina. Mm -hmm. And I think also worth mentioning is the fact that you will need to have deep customer knowledge within each and every Absolutely. segment. That will be a deciding factor when it comes to who we win this It game. will be. Mm -hmm. I think, Martin, it's time for a bit of a deep dive into some of our segments. And I will now leave you and Jan, because I believe that we have a colleague of ours coming in. Follow me. Now that is what I call making an entrance. And what a beautiful truck you have there, Roger. Uh, isn't it, Kina? Uh, it's fantastic. What is it that you're driving? This is an electric heavy duty Volvo truck. And this is actually the world's first, in our opinion, the heavy duty electrified construction truck in the world. Mm -hmm. And this truck is used by the construction company Swirok. They have two electric trucks from us in real operation today. And the feedback from Swirok is very positive. Yeah, I guess our customer, I mean, they must, they must love it. Absolutely, absolutely. And there's so many benefits. It's impro improving the productivity and the flexibility. And the drivers, they are really appreciating the reduced noise and less vibration. And that is improving their working environment and the quality of life. And then the trucks is coming with zero exhaust emission. Mm. And both you and I can drive it, which says definitely, a lot about the technology. Uh, you might have seen that lately there has been a lot of news coming out of the mm. Volvo Group on our electric offerings. And this morning it was your turn, Volvo Trucks, taking a very important step on your electrification journey. Yes, that is right. And we have been selling medium-duty electric trucks since 2019. Feedback that we are getting from customers is very positive. In North America, we already have the VNR electric into commercial 
of operation. And the official sales start for the VNR electric will be on the 3rd of December. But the big news today is that from next year we will start to sell the complete range of heavy duty electrified trucks. And we will start to do that in Europe. The production will start from serial production in 2022. And I guess that will make you the market maker, Roger. Definitely. And we are sure that we are leader in the terms of an electrification race. We see this as a big step changer with a lot of opportunities. And our ambition is to gain an even higher market share than we have today, because we are so early out with our offer. We are driving the transformation. And, and we are actually building a new market, not replacing an old one. Just look at our global picture of our electric lineup of new products. It's super fantastic. I, I only have one little, little problem with the truck, and that is the fact that this happens to be a non parking zone. Would you mind reparking, and then you can join me inside because now it's getting really, really windy. And in the meantime, I will let you watch another movie. And this is also Roger driving, but this time it's a new truck that you will get very, very soon. Might not have Roger's hairy arms, but Jessica, at least some goosebumps. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, it's fantastic. Volvo Trucks, product management, that is your role in the company. Uh, I mean, we're standing in front of another fantastic truck. And I think one of the questions that our viewer might have is, how do we go to market with these amazing equipment? Oh, they are so nice. Um, we will, of course, have the truck. Um, but on top of that, we will also have uh, charging and uh, financing and services. But we also work with logistic advising and support with implementing the system. One of the other things that is really good with this truck is that it's built on the same type of chassis as we have for the diesel trucks. This means that we can build a very wide uh, type of configuration to fit into the customer's operation. But we also think it's important to work with other actors to create an ecosystem for this uh, truck to really operate in. And what kind of ecosystems are, are needed? I mean, we look at the full chain to make sure that we really can decarbonize the, the complete system. So this means, for instance, that we work with uh, infrastructure, but also on green energy. On top of this, we also work in a different way with our customers, where we have a very close collaboration. And we have a specialized team of experts, and they work uh, very closely together with transport buyers and transport operators to really analyze their operation, to find wh what flows can be electrified today, but also tomorrow based on how the technology will evolve. So with this type of approach, we really build a specialized journey towards a decarbonized transport. Mm. And, and Roger, he talked about happy customers, loving the products. What is your view? What do they say when they talk to you? Uh, I mean, it's quite easy to come and talk about these trucks because everyone is really longing for these type of solutions. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, a special project that we have in California. It's the Lights Project, because it really encompasses all the things that I've been talking about. There we started with analyzing the operation. We uh, identify where we should start the electrification journey. We proposed a solution, we gathered partners to form the ecosystem, and we are right now implementing the system. This is very similar to what we will do together with uh, ICA, uh, the leading grocery retailer in Sweden that we have just formed a partnership with. Mm. And 
what we also know is that once we have formed this basic uh, ecosystem, then we can scale and really build profitable business. Mm. Sounds really good. Roger is coming in. Did we mm. avoid a parking ticket, Roger? I, I did. Okay. It's many nice people here. Oh, that's good to know. Your final words, please. Uh, we, we see this as a big step change with a lot of opportunities. And our ambition is clear. We want to gain an even higher market share than we have today. We know the customers, we have the relations with the customers, and we are building the trust with our customers. And we are sure that we are leading the race in terms of electrification. Mm. Thank you so much, Ronja. Thank you so much, Jessica. This sounds very comforting. Now we are going to move on to a segment which is really exciting to electrify, and that is waste management. Uh, imagine New York City, one of the toughest operating environments in the world. And New York, they have very high ambition when when it comes to become leader in a carbon-free society. And they are turning to Mack Trucks to solve it. Mayor de Blasio has asked us to be as carbon neutral as possible. We should be 80% carbon free by 2035. And the only way to get there is with electrification. So the Department of Sanitation is very, very proud to be the recipient of the first fully electric Mack truck. And the city of New York is very excited about it. The electrification of our refuse fleet provides us with not just zero tailpipe emissions, but also a noise-free truck which means we could use it on any shift and not worry about disturbing the public in any way. I would hope that other cities could learn from what we do based on the expectations of New York City because, you know what, we're, we're at the leading edge of everything. And other cities eventually are going to follow suit. You just got to love Rocky, don't you? Now let's bring in Marty Weisberg. He's joining us from the Mac campus in the US. Marty, please tell us about the potential in this segment. No. And, Thank uh, you, Kina. Hello. New York City is indeed a very strong example of how our customers are also transforming and leading in sustainability. The transformation of the Volvo Group and Mac Trucks is in partnership with our customers. We have the winning formula. The Volvo Group Global Technology Platforms plus Mack Truck Industry Expertise, for example, in waste and recycling, plus large leading customers who are also transforming. This equals the winning formula meeting the needs of our customers' customers. The Mack LR Electric, which you see behind me and in the picture, is Mack Truck's first entry into the electrical vehicle marketplace. And it's how we are transforming an industry where, as you will hear, we are already a leader. We manufacture the components and the complete truck in our existing facilities in the US, leveraging our existing industrial assets. Department of Sanitation, who, from whom you just hear, heard, is one of the world's largest municipal sanitation operations. They have in New York over 6,000 pieces of equipment, 2,000 of which are heavy duty collection vehicles. And the vast majority of those are Mack trucks. New York City is an example of a very loyal and large Mack customer for decades. As we see in the next slide, waste and recycling is just one of the many industries and examples where the Volvo Group both performs and transforms. The Volvo Group has products and services that cover every work step in the waste and recycling industry. Some of these work steps are shown in this picture. For example, collection or landfill work. Mack Trucks and the Volvo Group, we're experts in this business. We know the business and the needs of our customers. And with construction equipment, trucks, financial services, we have this industry very well covered and supported. We cross sell very effectively in this segment. Waste and recycling is of course a large and growing business globally. The North American market is also large, growing and dynamic. 
annual industry volumes in just North America are approximately 8,000 heavy duty trucks a year, over 1,000 medium duty trucks each year put into service, and close to 3,000 pieces of construction equipment each year, just into the waste and recycling industry. And Mack Trucks has been a leader in this segment for generations. We have close to 40% market share in this segment. We're very well known for the safety, productivity, and reliability of our products. And for the fact that we keep our fleet rolling so that our customers know that they have a reliable team of Mack Trucks working. This industry is at the core of our core. So you can say Mack has been highly performing in this industry for generations. And now, from this very strong foundation, the transformation accelerates with the inclusion of electric vehicles into this business. And just as the Volvo Group is transforming, so are our customers. Sustainability is the primary focus of our customers. They are taking big actions and big investments in their transformation towards green and clean in waste and recycling. Our customers in this segment, be it public or private entities, seek to lead on sustainability. Let's now hear from another large and important Mac customer on this very topic. We've led the way in the industry on sustainability. We're recognized for that. Basically being good stewards of the environment, that's gonna be an ongoing job for us. What can we do that's good for people, good for the planet, still good for profits? And uh, we believe all those things are possible. They're not mutually exclusive. You know, a lot of our new employees really comment coming in the door how they feel good and responsible for this work of keeping things clean, for recycling and being good stewards of the earth. Our people have been working with Mac on, on getting all the data collected. How much weight do we need to carry? What distance do we need to run? How many hours? What, at what temperatures? So we're excited to see this thing in real life. I think Mac's taking a big leap forward here with the electric truck. We're super excited to be part of it. Republic Services is Mac Truck's largest customer. And as you just heard, they are leading on sustainability. They do this in partnership with Mack Trucks, which is part then of the winning formula. As we see in this slide, it's really all about how we do this together. That is the winning formula. Again, the Volvo Group global technology platforms, Mack market leadership position in segments like waste and recycling, our customers, driving their transformation of clean and green, coming together to meet the demands of our customers' customers. And we do this in a good way. Our electric vehicle commercialization process is well underway with many existing customers. And as you have heard today from two very important and large customers, it's about more than just the truck. It's the entire ecosystem that ensures profitable operations and good service to their customers as well. And the Volvo Group has this strong ecosystem in place. Some of the elements of this ecosystem you see in this picture. It's more than just the truck. It's the complete business model, including, as example, route planning and uptime. This ecosystem allows us to lead the transformation. The transformation is here and now, real trucks in real applications running with real customers. We have the formula and we are winning. People, planet, profits. Back to you, Kina. Thank you so much, Marty. Always full speed ahead. Now to our third segment, Deep Dive, which is building and construct construction. And let me introduce Melke, head of Volvo Construction Equipment, and Nils, Volvo Autonomous Solutions. Uh, starting with you, Melke, there are a lot of exciting things going on within your business area. Yes, Kina, there are a lot of fun and exciting things going on within Volvo Construction Equipment. I think this is uh, cool and also a very good example of upsides we see with electric machines. CO2 and emissions, of course, but here 
maybe even more important with the noise. And that will open up for many, many opportunities for us going forward. Talking about agriculture, indoor, working in cities during night, etc. Last year, we were the first to commit to an electric future for our compact machines. And we stopped the diesel engine development for this range. And I think this is a very smart way to start, because compact is not our strongest area. I would say it's a yellow dot on Jan's favorite dot slide. And we should compare this with the total Volvo CE business, where we have shown a consistent improvement, both in sales and profitability, even during this year. Since the announcement, we have seen a fast development of the product, extensive customer testing with a lot of good feedback, and we have also prepared our own production as well as the whole supply chain. Within a couple of weeks, we will deliver the first machines to customers. Real deliveries, real customers, real customer order production, no prototypes. We started our electromobility journey in Europe and we have now launched in 12 countries. And just a couple of weeks ago, we got our first order also in North America. Next is China. And in the end of this month, we will unveil two electric excavators at the Bauma China event. We start with the smaller machines. First, because that is where the demand will start. And obviously, it's also good for our business. But it's also more easy from a technology perspective. So I think this is a very good way into the electromobility world, both for us, our dealers, and our customers. We are learning so much. And I think we have a strong and good plan moving into bigger machines, taking of course, batteries and fuel cells, but also for us, important hydraulics and recuperation into consideration. I would like to add one thing, and that is adding connectivity into the equation gives a lot of opportunities. I think Volvo Group, we have a unique uh, position here with our strong portfolio our capabilities of cross-selling and taking a bigger part of the ecosystem. I would like to show you one example now, what can happen if you, in a smart way, connect an excavator with a number of trucks. And this example comes from Westlenken here in Gothenburg. Med det här nya systemet så har vi full kontroll på lastningsgraden då. Maskinisten ser ju till att det är fulla last. Bilarna går färre vänder vilket är bra för både miljö och ekonomi för oss. Och så för maskinisten och lastbilschauffören då så är det ju ett lättare sätt för dem att följa produktionen och vara med. Maskinisten gör ett knapptryck när han är klar. Då kommer det upp in i lastbilen hur många ton han har fått vart han ska åka med lasset. Så det är väldigt lätt där. De behöver aldrig gå ut och riskera att någon kliver ut och trampas nät och gör sig illa eller någonting. Så det är jättebra på det viset. Förut var det ju papper och penna då och räkna lass. Arbetet kommer ju förenklas på det viset att vi kommer ha full kontroll över produktionen hela tiden. I realtid. På ett enklare sätt än vad vi hade tidigare. I think it's obvious what kind of value we create in the flow here. Uh, taking away waste, uh, improve the productivity and reduce the environmental impact. Only in this project, the efficient loadout will take away 8,000 transport through Gothenburg city. 8,000 less transport through the city. So I think it's obvious that connectivity, it's a clear win-win-win. Win for the customers, win for Volvo and also win for society. So Nils, I think we have a good and clear roadmap and journey for electromobility and connectivity. So do we find a good win also for automation here? Yeah, Melke, I concur. Autom autonomous solution based on electrification and based on connectivity, they do create new value for our customers. We increase the safety on the work site, we have higher productivity, we have low to no emission, and we drastically reduce the noise level. I think 
what we should do, Melker, is we should have a look, a closer look at our Tara solution, where the vehicle, which you see here, forms part of a total transport system. What an exciting solution. And with the Tara solution, we're making a market. And we're making that market today. We unlock value for our customers by providing flexibil flexibility and precision. This solution, which you've seen, can run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And if demand goes down, production and production cost follow the demand curve. This flexibility turns into efficiency and that turns into customer success. Now, another key objective for our customers is safety. And safety is also in the DNA of the Volvo Group. And with the Tara solution, we are in a position to demonstrate a very strong safety concept on the customer side. We are able to take out the human being from dangerous applications. We are able to remove the customer from a hazardous environment. Now, there's a third element which I want to talk about, and this relates to what Melker said at the beginning. It happens when you combine electrification and autonomous technology. If you put those two elements together, you unlock a further very important value for our customer. Ah, not only for the customer, for the society. I speak about sustainability. Here we make a true difference. We're in a very strong position to reduce significantly the CO2 footprint with the Tara solution on the customer side. We're closing at the moment a long-year contract with one of our key accounts. And in that quarry, through the Tara solution, we're able to reduce the CO2 footprint by 85%, which is, of course, remarkable. I think is we have seen so many fantastic results with, uh, with this so far, not at least on the, on the CO2 side. I think, I think it's fantastic. But we're also talking about uh, new business models. Yeah. So what kind of business models are we going to use yeah. in, in this? Yeah, I think, Melke, this is a very relevant question because this beautiful machine which you see here is actually not for sale. We're a solution provider and our product is transport as a service. So we are generating long-term contracts with our customers where the machine, together with the autonomous driving system and a site control system, they form a total offer, which is then supported by Volvo uptime services, by site-specific infrastructure, and by a state-of-the-art payment solution coming from Volvo Financial Services. And then, depending on the customer's choice, the customer can decide to operate the solution on their own, or Volvo Autonomous Solutions comes into play and we operate on behalf of the customer. Now in this constellation, we actually go deeper into the value chain for the Volvo Group and we are unlocking further value from the site. Now the approach you see here, transport as a service, is common for all the segments we target at Volvo Autonomous Solutions. And let's have a look at the next slide where I illustrate a little bit the markets or the segments we're focusing on. Now, to begin with, the market availability of autonomous solutions is different segment by segment. This is driven by the complexity of the technology, but this is also driven by regulations, but also by society buy-in. Now, we have chosen to start in the confined segment, because here we can demonstrate a very strong safety concept, and we can introduce customers, but also society it itself, to this new technology, and we do this in a very pragmatic, but in a safe way. In this segment, the first one here, Quarian Aggregates, this is where we come with our Tara solution. And again, we are making the market here. We are in this market and we have started to scale here. 
we have on hand a very sizable business pipeline as we speak, worth 1.5 billion SEC. And of course, we know the addressable market is a multiple of that. But also, in this segment, the partnership between Melker and myself comes visible, because Melker, you're actually the one who provides me with the machine. First of all, Nils, I think it's the, absolutely the right segment to start in. I think the potential is big here from the beginning. And I also happy to see the, all the cooperation that we have in the group to be able to, to supply these kind of systems. It's great to see. Coming back to what Martin mentioned earlier about the group's commitment that we have to our stakeholders yeah. about 100% safe, 100% yeah. fossil free and 100% more productive. I think Tara is a great example because Tara is not a product. And Tara is a great example of the platform and, and the system that helps us to achieve all mm -hmm. of this. No, I fully agree with you here, but, but also with, with, with Martin's comments, absolutely. But I also think it's actually good to see the way we're working together here as one Volvo, because that also helps us to perform on another level. But uh, let's not forget focus here on that, on that slide. I want also to talk about the other two segments. And the segment, second segment I want to talk about, here we target the first mile. This is about autonomous solution for ports and logistics centers. And also here we are active. We're implementing first pilot applications with our customers. This is a segment, but it's also the third one, where we receive strong interest from customers all over the world ready to partner up with Volvo. The third segment here, uh, it's on highway trucking in the US. It's also called uh, hub to hub High potential, large opportunity, bit further out from a, from a timeline point of view and with certain dependencies, but strong focus from Volvo Autonomous Solutions also on, on, that on that segment, that we're able to leverage that segment when the time is there. But in summary, Melkus' approach, my approach is the same and it is clear. We have a strong basis. We are in business today when it comes to utilizing new technologies. We are creating new value for our customers, but also for the Volvo Group. Kina. Thank you so much, guys. Crystal clear. Uh, I really enjoy your collaboration, I must say that. So we have looked at three segments, on-road, waste management, and building and construction. And one of the questions you might have is, OK, how and when will all this happen? Stay tuned. So, three segment deep dives, Martin, your reflection. Uh, first and foremost, I mean, I have to admit, of course, that we have uh, rehearsed it uh, uh, before, but every time I listen to my business leaders or our business leaders, I become really excited about how motivated we are to make this happen. Uh, but how will we make it happen? I think that is the most important key. Man. And uh, if you look at this slide that is demonstrating our way up to, first and foremost, to the more than 35% by 2030 and beyond, uh, this is, of course, a continuous journey when it comes to the total market that you see here on the, the black uh, line. But what is more important, obviously, is that uh, the transformation and shift will happen segment by segment, market by market, and region by region. And why is it so? Yeah, because different segments and markets are better fitted to do the transformation. So you will see here, of course, this is... Uh, illustrative uh, slide, but you will see, for example, distribution coming in, waste and recycling that we heard, certain areas of construction. But another very important point here, Kina, is when it will happen, when it's a good fit in the market and in a segment, the shift will happen rather quick. And that is how the black line uh, gradually and eventually will be built up here. So what we have heard here now is how our business areas are prepared. They have the rollout of different products. They are ready. They will sell solutions. But one question is, of course, are our technology leaders and our industrial leaders ready to take on this challenge? Let's bring in those guys, Martin. They are coming here.
There we are. So what we have learned is that once it has started, it will in fact happen very fast. And one successful that success factor, that will be to have a robust transformation plan in place that builds on strong products and solutions, an industrial backbone, and of course, superb technology. Now, Lars, our CTO, would you mind shed some light on where we stand from a technology perspective when it comes to our transformation? Absolutely. You've heard it today, our commitment to the Paris Agreement. You've heard it, our commitment to decarbonize transport 2050. That means 2050, we must have a rolling fleet that is completely fossil free 2050. Our products have a life length of approximately 10 years. And that means that everything that we are delivering after 2040 will be part of that rolling fleet 2050. So for us, it means 100% fossil free from 2040. This is a journey. And uh, the starting point of that journey was, of course, uh, combustion engines. Combustion engines running on fossil diesel with a touch of biofuel. So biofuels then, what about biofuels going towards 2040, 2050? What role can biofuels play when decarbonizing transport? Can we rely on biofuels? The answer must be no, unfortunately. There will be biofuels, definitely, but uh, we are convinced that the biofuels will be directed to towards other industries, other sectors with uh, greater need than ours. Talk about um, aviation, talking about uh, maritime applications. So there will simply not be enough biofuel available to decarbonize road transport and construction equipment. So the absolute majority of the vehicles around 2040 will be electric. We are convinced that we talk about fuel cell electric vehicles and we talk about battery electric vehicles. We don't know exactly the mix, the share in between these two technologies, but we are convinced that both technologies will play a major and important role. There will be high volumes coming from both technologies. A very high share of electric vehicles here 2040. That means all of a sudden that the target that you heard Martin talking about earlier, 35% electric vehicles around 2030, is all of a sudden turning in, into something completely different than just an ambitious target. It is to be honest where we need to be 2030 on this journey. It is of course important to underline that uh, all these electric vehicles, if they are truly to be fossil free and to de decarbonize transport, they must run on green electricity and they need to run on hydrogen that is produced in a sustainable way. In this area, there is still a lot to do when it comes to investments in production and infrastructure. Still more to do from a societal, uh, societal perspective, but we are convinced this will happen. With the majority of the vehicles 2040 being electric, we anyhow foresee that there will be applications where we will need combustion engines for a long, long, long period of time. And those combustion engines, they will of course run on biofuel. That small amount of biofuel that will be dedicated to our industry. We are talking about, for example, HVO, talking about biogas, and we are also talking about hydrogen. But in that context, hydrogen in combustion engines, an area that we are seriously looking into right now with a lot of uh, potential. The combustion engine as such still has a lot of potential. And the combustion engine will be very important for us for a long period of time. With 35% electric vehicles 2030, well then, to be honest, simple mathematics tells us 
that two-thirds of the vehicles by then will be driven by combustion engines. Combustion engine and those vehicles will remain a cash cow for the Volvo Group, enabling the necessary R&D investments and safeguarding a strong financial performance. We know from press tests, we know from customer testimonials that this machine, our turbo compound engine, is leading when it comes to fuel economy, meaning leading already today when it comes to CO2 emissions. On the way towards decarbonized transport, there will be legislative milestones when it comes to CO2 across the globe, in Europe 2025 and 2030, for example. We will continue to invest in combustion engines and into after-treatment systems in order to meet those legislative milestones and to stay competitive. There is a lot of potential still when it comes to raising efficiency out of these machines. But the big, really big transformational shift is definitely electrification. This is our modular electric driveline. Electric motor, gearbox, prop shaft connected to an axle. We use this very driveline for trucks, for buses, for construction equipment and for pent applications. It is a very good example of our modular product thinking. We call it common architecture, shared technology, in short, cost. Same interfaces, same components for buses, trucks, construction equipment. This is how we create synergies in R&D, in production and in our service business. But the modular thinking doesn't stop there. For the lightest applications, we use one electrical motor. For the somewhat heavier applications, two of the electrical motors. And for the heaviest ones, we're going to use three of the identical electrical motors. That gives us the possibility to create volumes already now in the early phases of electrification. Today, we use this driveline in our battery electric vehicles, but this driveline will also form the base for our fuel cell electric vehicles. In our industry, the possibility to um, offer a wide combination of variants is key in order to deliver tailor-made solutions to our customers. This is important independently on what kind of driveline the customer wants. Take axles, applications that demand two axles or three axles, four axles or even five axles. Take cabs, for example, a car transporter. They just need a low roof so that they can get the car on top of the roof of that cab. A construction vehicle needs a short day cab and a long haul vehicle needs a big spacious cab with a high roof. The list of available options in combination with each other is in principle unlimited. Now this well-proven variety of options can easily be made available also with electrified drivelines. I dare to say that this broad, well-proven product offering is one of our main advantages if you compare us with some of the new players that try to enter into our industry. The development of batteries is definitely key. This is our cost battery. We use exactly this battery in buses, in trucks, in construction equipment. We use it in Europe, we use it in North America. Battery development is super fascinating. We have just started production of vehicles with the second generation of this battery. It is exactly the same pack, the same box, identical interfaces, identical dimensions, but inside. Second generation compared to first generation, plus 35% energy at the lower cost per kilowatt hour. And my engineers, they are now in final development stages for the third generation, keeping the box, identical interfaces, Third generation compared to the second one, another plus 40% energy at even lower cost per kilowatt hour. 
The pace in battery development is not slowing down. The performance race is not slowing down. So in such a vibrant, fast-moving area, you should team up with the best ones. And we are extremely happy with our partnership with Samsung in the area of batteries. Battery electric vehicles is one pathway towards electrification. One. For long-haul vehicles and for heavy on- and off-road applications, we are firm believers of that fuel cells will be the technology to use. That will be the solution. Since fuel cell technology is rather new, I would like to share with you an animation showing how it works. Fuel cell electric vehicles, where the electricity is produced on board the vehicle with the help of hydrogen and oxygen. So how does it work? A fuel cell uses hydrogen and oxygen in the air to produce electricity and water. The fuel cell consists of a membrane coated with a catalyst. When the hydrogen molecules hit the catalyst, they are split into hydrogen ions and electrons. The membrane lets hydrogen ions pass through, but not the electrons, which instead flow through an electric circuit where the electric current is generated. At the cathode side, the hydrogen ions, electrons, and the oxygen in the air combine to produce water. In order to produce enough electricity to be able to propel a vehicle, a complete fuel cell system consists of several hundred of membranes stacked together. The fuel cell system is dimensioned for normal use, but whenever extra power is needed, it's provided by a battery on the vehicle. And when the fuel cells produce more power than the truck currently needs, the excess energy is used to charge the battery. The battery will also be charged by brake energy from the vehicle. A control unit balances the dynamics between fuel cells and battery to optimize the use of energy. Through this process, we can provide the same operational range and load capacity as a vehicle with a diesel engine, but with zero emissions. I know that I'm somewhat biased, but uh, that's cool uh, for real. I'm really excited when it comes to our joint venture together with Daimler when it comes to fuel cells. The intention with this joint venture is to develop, produce and commercialize fuel cell systems for heavy duty applications. By doing this, we will share the cost for the development and together we will also create the necessary volumes in order to be able to produce fuel cells. Because production of fuel cells is definitely a game where scale matters in order to reach the right product cost level. It is right now somewhat of a hype around fuel cells and the hydrogen economy. And uh, it's very important for you to understand that uh, our tough applications means that there is today no off-the-shelf ready fuel cell product. Our tough demands when it comes to continuous power, when it comes to life length, is something completely different compared to past cars. In this joint venture together with Daimler now, we're going to use the combined experience from Daimler and the Volvo Group in order to develop fuel cell systems meeting the tough requirements from our applications. But the joint venture is more than just combining experiences. I see the joint venture also as a statement to society. Think about it. Two of the biggest players now, both committing to fuel cells, committing to hydrogen. It's a signal, it's a direction, meaning that others now dare to step in and invest into production of hydrogen and infrastructure. This joint venture will operate on its own, having agility and speed. We plan to have commercial solutions on the roads somewhere between 2025 and 2030. But watch out, we will be out there on the roads long before that with different kinds of trials and pilots. But the fuel cell systems that we develop in this joint venture will just be one part of a fuel cell vehicle. There is much more technology to be developed that will be developed in the Volvo Group 
meaning that on a vehicle level we will and we will stay fierce competitors with Daimler and the other guys. And I can assure you that the ambition towards my engineers is clear. We're going to be winners also when it comes to fuel cell electric vehicles. So electrification is happening here and now, today and onwards. We are in serial production in Europe. We will be in serial production in US next year and in the years to come. We have a massive rollout plan. For me as CTO of the Volvo Group, it's extremely satisfying to see how much synergies we are creating across the group, across the different products when it comes to battery electric vehicles and when it comes to fuel cell electric vehicles. So, Kina, you asked if um, if we are prepared for this transformation, and uh, well, I think the answer is a massive rollout of products in the years to come. Yes, so the answer is yes, with capital letters and exclamation marks, if you. Lars, since I got to know you, and that's quite a few years ago now, I've heard you say many times, now it's the time to be an engineer. But now I feel that it's really the time to be an engineer. Yeah, I think that you're right. I mean, uh, it's obvious for everyone that a lot of the solutions that we will need now will be technology and engineering driven. So, uh, yes, <laughs> this is the era of engineering. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lars. So, as we said, to be able to win this game, we also need a strong industrial backbone and you need to be able to scale. Now I am joined by Jens Holtinger. A new face to some, perhaps. Uh, you are the new head of our global track manufacturing organization. And you will speak about the industrial system as a true asset. But before I, I, I sort of kick you off, um, a common question that we normally get, Jens, yeah. is to what extent do we need to invest in new production facilities mm. and new lines to meet this transformation? To be honest, I, I think that is a bit of a misconception. And, uh, you know, I'm an industrial guy, so I'll give you a straightforward answer. We like no, we no. will not build okay, new so plants. A big and big It's a big no, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, kick it off. Thank you. Uh, let me talk a little bit about how we will do this. And um, before I start explaining, I, I think I will talk, what are the drivers for flexibility in the industrial system? You saw Martin's slide earlier, where we talked about segment, starting them up, segment by segment. Next step will be an S-curve by segment. And on top of that, we will have the region by region and the geographical spread. So, of course, that will demand extreme flexibility from an industrial system. So how to solve that? Of course, we need to leverage on what we have. So looking at this, you see a fishbone. It's classical. We've worked with it for years, so that's not new as a concept. But what is new is that when we work together and we create this modular electrical product, we can utilize this by also creating a modular industrial setup. So you see these subflows where we actually prepare our different uh, electrical components. And then we simply mix an electrical truck next to an electrical truck and we will have them. And what we call this system is mixed model assembly. And then you will actually create a seamless possibility to just ramp up and mix the different modules. So this is a PowerPoint. This is a strategy, but it's happening right now as we speak. We already started this spring. This spring we started and we are doing this exactly what we're doing. So looking at Blainville, our factory in France, where we have already started to produce our medium trucks. And you see here, we follow a truck going through the factory and we are preparing them component by component, exchanging that for where we use a diesel component and actually putting in an electrical component. And by that, we are filling, fulfilling and setting up our mixed model assembly. So we are doing it as we speak. I sometimes also get the question, how much do we need to invest? Is it expensive to transform this? And just to give you a little bit of idea on that, uh, if we have, let's say we have a final assembly plant, it is capital level, let's say we have a hundred of index to what its value is. When we add, you say, some of these subflows, 
We add some safety features. We are working with high voltage, very important. We are talking about maybe adding 5 to 10% of investment. But that is the capital value. I think also important to talk about the human capital that we have. So, going into our plant that we have here in Gothenburg, our pilot plant, where we are now preparing. We are, as we speak again, talking about preparing our heavy duty range. The FH and the FM. We are preparing it for high volume and with step by step preparing it for mixed model assembly. And here we see we have our product development together with purchasing, together with our industrial engineering. They step by step, module by module, they are preparing this for a very good setup. But I think also going further into this with competence, it's not only about setting up mixed model assembly. I think in very many of our final assembly plants, I would say 95% of the competence that we have today, we will reuse going into the electrical era. The challenges are very much the same, so we will reuse the competence. And I would like also to mention our powertrain system. Uh, we are today producing engines, gearboxes, but then take an example of Köping or Skövde, big factories here in Sweden. What is their real competence? Yeah, they're good at costing, they're good at heat treatment, machining, high precision automated assembly. True assets going forward when we go into the new era and we can look at other components. So, we have talked about the segment taking off, the S-curve, now talk about geography. What we see here is a global map. Starting in Europe 2020, we are preparing very quickly. We will move out by 2022. We see that we are expanding even further. And by 2025, we will and we have the capability to have a global reach and the possibility to produce electrical vehicles in a global footprint. So, to conclude, we will reuse, we will not write off, and Kina, we will use the same platform and the same plants. Mm. Jens, so what you're basically saying is that from an industrial perspective, your perspective, entering into electrification, is, it, it sounds as if it's not harder than a common product launch. We have a solid organization. We have fantastic people. We will do that. Very comforting. Thank you so much. It's uh, time to move on again. So, dear viewers, we have been talking about applications, new technology, new business models, solution selling, all pieces in a puzzle. Now, we would like to show you how these pieces, pieces fit together and creates that puzzle that will make us, the Volvo Group, our customers and the society as a whole winners in this transformation. Because it is when all elements come together that is when we create a true win for all. Martin. Thank you, Kina. And obviously uh, this journey will be about following this opportunity and not only following uh, when it comes to the shift from a customer point of view, but be part of the journey and take the lead. And in order to take the lead, it's not about following the, the black line here. It is really to lead the acceleration that will happen segment by segment, market by market, and region by region. And in order to do so, uh, I will take you on a small journey of how we think this will work. The next step is to really look into what we have been talking about, application, excellence, and different industry verticals. And if we look at that uh, uh, development, how it looks like, here you have an example of a number of industry verticals. We are talking about distribution, uh, we are talking about mining, long haul, and construction. And as you can see, we are not only talking about the application and the industry vertical, but we are also talking about different type of geographies and countries. And why is that important? First and foremost, because 
when you talk about, for example, distribution, you have a certain uh, cost pie uh, consisting of uh, the cost for drivers, the cost for fuel, for the vehicle depreciation, for financing, for insurance, and for repair maintenance. And then you have a different constitution when it comes to mining in Indonesia or when it comes to long haul in Europe. And why is it so? Yeah, first and foremost, because the application in itself drives a different behavior when it comes to uptime, when it comes to uses of mileage and other factors. But also, of course, the different geographies gives also uh, specifics like salary levels, energy prices, uh, specific legislations and other specific factors. So here it is a game about really making the tailor-made specification for every customer for their application. So if we take it one step further and talk a little bit about one segment that will really accelerate here and now, and that is grocery retail or food retail in Europe and in the Nordics. First and foremost, because those companies uh, have a very uh, powerful sustainability agenda themselves. They want really to show how they can drive this sustainability to the next level. But they also have a very close interaction with us as consumers and, and customers. Uh, when we are coming to the uh, retail shop, we are already today able to make a number of deliberate choices. And we see how that is accelerating. We are picking the ecological milk. Uh, we are uh, looking for uh, uh, packaging that is more sustainable, moving away from plastics. Uh, we are interacting with the uh, grocery uh, retail uh, companies about how to minimize uh, the waste of food, uh, to do that in a smart way. Uh, but there are even more to be done here. And therefore, when you look at uh, this opportunity, here you see the typical uh, cost chart of uh, a retail uh, company, and in the Nordics in this case. Here you see the total cost of this company. And the small piece you see here, approximately 6%, is the transport cost. Okay? On this side, you see the total CO2 emitted from this company. And as you can see here, approximately 30% of the CO2 is emitted uh, from transport. So it's a really interesting equation here. 6% of the cost, 30% of the CO2. So if you take that one step further, knowing that here and now with our solutions, talking about the total cost of operation for a battery electric distribution uh, solution, it is today approximately 10 to 15% higher in over the life cycle. But what does that mean in reality? It means that 6% transport cost, 30% CO2, and if you take them, the ability to go for 10 to 15% uh, higher TCO, what you will get is a total cost increase of 6% in transport cost, multiply by the 15% cost increase, so 0.15, given 1%. So bottom line here, we are talking about a cost increase in total of 1% and reducing at the same time the CO2 with 100% for transport and for 30% for the global scope of this company. It is just a fantastic equation. And to make it even more tangible, uh, think about us as consumers then, coming back to this situation, and say, okay, I'm standing in front of this milk shelf and can make a decision. Should I go for a milk transported in the normal way, costing one euro per liter, or should I go for a milk transported in a 100% fossil free way, paying one euro and one euro cent? And I think it is a rather simple choice. And that is the logic why this shift will happen here and now, and it will go fast. So if we take this to the next step and expanding transport cost, what are the dynamics moving from diesel to electric? Yeah, we need to come back to the total cost of the food retailer. We see here the small uh, piece of um, uh, transport cost, 6%. And what we do now is to expand that. We expand that, how the constitution looks for diesel, and we expand that, how the constitution looks for battery electric, to have a, a view on the dynamics that is happening here. And the dynamics is the following. Diesel, 
is constituting of one piece here that is similar regardless if it's diesel powered or a battery electric that is related to driver, administration and others. Uh, but the right side is where the dynamics is coming in. Here you have today uh, four uh, distinctive parts. You have the vehicle depreciation, including the body build. You have repair and maintenance over the life cycle. And you have finance and insurance. And finally, energy cost. And for a diesel power truck, it is diesel. Everything here is cost per kilometer and, of course, ballpark figure, since everything is very specific for each customer. When you are then moving into battery electric, one very important thing is happening. You are pushing in a new piece here, and that is what Lars talked about, the battery system. That is the energy system uh, containing then the batteries and the surrounding control systems and cooling. A rather big piece of the cost chart here. But the very positive abatement, obviously, is that you're pushing down the need or the cost of energy per kilometer. And the reason for that uh, decrease is twofold. Number one, that the efficiency out from an electric motor is considerably higher, well above 90%, whereas for a combustion engine, even the best one that Lars is doing is around 50%. And number two, because you have also a positive uh, arbitrage uh, when it comes to the uh, energy prices as such between electricity and diesel, and in this case in the Nordic countries. But that will happen more and more when we are moving into massive renewable investments across the globe. So this is really the dynamics that is happening. If we then take it to the next level and talk, why could that be a competitive solution and how will that play out? Yeah, then we are coming to these four pieces here and talk about them. And the outcome is the most important. Of course, providing this as an equipment, as a service over the life cycle. And what are the outcomes that a customer expects in order to move from diesel into battery electric? It's a big and bold move. Of course, they expect, and rightly so, uh, visibility on cost per kilometer, to have the same safety standard, to have the application uh, excellence for productivity, uh, to have the fossil-free execution, to have uh, uptime. Because here we are talking about solutions that requires an uptime of 98%. And of course, they require that also moving forward. And in totality, they would like to have peace of mind. And that comes together when these four areas are actually combined. It is about vehicle, it is about repair and maintenance, financing, insurance, and battery systems. And in order to explain that, I have to go one step deeper. Look at this. I start with the vehicle. What is happening here? Yeah, number one, what are the prerequisites for excelling as a customer? That is to have a tailor-made specification for that specific use, wherever you are in the world. And to get there, you need to have application knowledge and customer contacts and relations. That is a starting point. And in addition, you need to pull from a modular product system to combine the different elements from the application knowledge to make that tailor-made solution. Lars talked about it, but as Jens said, that is not enough. You need also to be able to scale, because when the shift is happening, it will go quick. And not only it will go quick, but you can also combine the force of the scale, volumes, and thereby cost execution that we are sitting on. This is what we do. The second piece is about repair and maintenance. Even a distribution truck will stand one day or two in muddy situations in north of Sweden or in Midwest in the US, or uh, early morning and hot morning in southern France with fresh food, and something has happened then they rely on the uptime services. That you have a dense network of trained, motivated technicians and poor people, uptime services through connected solutions, and not a daytime operation, but 24-7, including Christmas Eve. This is what we do. And then, financing insurance. It is even more important now when we talk about equipment as a service. We have the infrastructure, customer knowledge, relation, and trust, but also 
the different structures how to finance this as a solution and to work really close with the customer here. Very, very competent teams on a global scale. This is what we do. And finally, the battery system. 10 plus years of experience when it comes to uh, how to define the battery for each application in terms of durability, in terms of range, in terms of weight, in terms of route optimization, but even more, to have an established partnership that we can build the model platform upon, like with Samsung SDI. And in addition to that, of course, also the circular flow of the battery in order to cost optimize per kilometer. And what is required then? Obviously, after the first life, that we can utilize the battery packs for a second life of, for example, stationary power and recycling, thereby optimizing the full flow and taking down the cost per kilometer uh, for uh, the customers. So if we go back one, I just would like to conclude here. And, and that is also what we do. So in combination here, we have four very important parts. But I will come back where I started. The customer expects equipment as a services with six very important outcomes. And it is not about delivering on 75% of all these promises. In order to get to these six promises, you need to excel and to deliver of all of them. That is how you create a partnership a competitive solution, and how you make the shift from diesel into battery electric. The good news is that this is also a win situation for Volvo. By expanding this into these uh, different services, we will see on the next slide how that is playing out also for Volvo when it comes to uh, revenues and top line. What is happening is that our top line over the life cycle per installed unit is increasing. And it is increasing considerably because the equipment as a service is what the customers are expecting and requiring. And the revenue increase is in the magnitude of at least 50%. This is a true step change. So to summarize, this is a journey that is super exciting. And we are talking about the opportunity of a century. It is a story about growth and it's a story about resilience. Growth, because we will do a step change when it comes to market share. We are ready, we are ready to scale, and we are ready to meet the S-curves. It is a step change because the revenues per vehicle uh, during the life cycle will increase with 50% for electric vehicles, and with more than five times when it comes to autonomous solutions. It is a story of growth, because at least, and I say at least, 35% of our vehicles will be electric by 2030. And it is a story of growth because the underlying uh, need of transportation will continue to increase, but it must be done so in a considerably more sustainable way. But it's also a story about resilience. Equipment as a service and transport as a service will create our journey up to more than 50% of the revenues coming out from services by 2030. And also what is important, that it gives an even closer relation with the customers when it comes to penetration, duration, partnership of how to continue to develop this. But of course, the most important about this story is the journey towards a fossil-free society. And for Volvo, shaping the future of transportation and shaping the world that we want to live in. Kira. Thank you, Martin. This is such an eye-opener. Mm. I get emotional <laughs> as well as uh, like no, you No, but do. it's so exciting. Yeah, it is. And, and, it is. I, and I feel that also that energy from the whole organization, basically. So this is a story that we really want to share with everyone. Can you give me your one-line summary on all this? Because it's a massive piece to sort of take in. No, I, I think the one-line summary really is shaping the uh, future of transportation and also the opportunity of a century for all of us, for planet, for people, uh, and, and for, for also uh, opportunities for driving prosperity. That is uh, what I see. So 
uh, it's super exciting times. Yeah, I can really see that you <laughs> are enjoying this transformation. Yeah, it's an opportunity, it's not a threat. No, it's absolutely an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Stay put, um, we will soon change gear. Uh, but first, we have presented you with a lot of information today, a lot of slides, a lot of facts, and everything is available on volvogroup.com if you would like to sort of dig a little bit deeper. Now it is time to make room for all of you watching. We are going to end this Capital Markets Day with the opportunity to ask questions to our presenters. Let's move on. So we are going to do this uh, the following way. We have several listeners already. There we are. Let's take it from the beginning. Mm. So we are going to do this the following way. We have several listeners that have already queued up, ready with their questions on our business. And we're going to take them one by one. And the first one is actually Hampus Engelau from Handelsbanken. Please go ahead, Hampus. Thank you very much, Hampus Engelau, Handelsbanken. Uh, two questions for me. Um, when we have this type of a paradigm shift in the industry where, where you're changing towards more electrification, etc., um, we have also new entrants coming into the market, and we have seen initiatives both on fuel cells as well as in battery electrics, talking of Tesla and Nikola. Uh, these guys have started by Put, taking a battery and designing the product around that, uh, how much do you feel that that could be a competitive advantage towards your guys uh, taking an existing product and putting a battery in that? That's my first question. Would you like to start, Lars? Or? Absolutely. Uh, I was into it during my presentation as well. Uh, regarding the batteries, we have decided uh, to team up uh, with uh, Samsung SDI as our partners. Uh, they are, according to us, uh, absolutely world player, one of the best, absolutely best players when it comes to batteries in the world. That means that we get access to the latest and the greatest technologies. And our strong asset that we bring to this is, of course, that we have our well-proven product offering that we then now start to electrify. And that means uh, that compared to some of the new entrants that start with a rather sp small and narrow specification, we can easily go and electrify a very wide product offering in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lars. Hampus, please move on. Yes, uh, and then moving on to the next question, uh, at least in my world, uh, if, you, if you go fully battery electric, you remove 30, 40 percent of the moving parts in the vehicle and maybe learning something from the car industry that typically has resulted in a less service and spare parts business. And, but you're ambitious here to target to increase revenues by 50 percent. Can you maybe talk a little bit about uh, other solution services that you may be including in that, or, or are you seeing, in, are you looking at this in a different way than I am? No, first and foremost, uh, I mean, Hampus, not to be too technical, it depends really how you count, I mean, the moving parts here, because of course in a, in a, in a combustion engine you have a lot of moving parts. Uh, but when we look at the different type of services, uh, repairs uh, constituting of a repair and maintenance contract over the life cycle, as we talked about just recently, then it, it is less than 50% that is related to, to the engine in itself, because there are so many other elements also part of the repair and maintenance. Uh, so, so that is the first point, obviously. Then when I said the increase uh, up to 50%, that is, of course, because it's equipment as a service. So it's about duration, the depth of engagement. And as you know, for example, that our to today contract penetration is not at 100%, but here we clearly see that the customers would like to take that step. Maybe not to 100%, but considerably higher. So it will be a penetration game, it will be a depth of engagement, it will be duration, and it's not just to say 40% less because of moving parts. Uh, it is not that simple, because this is production equipment with a dura duration over seven, eight years, and with an uh, uptime requirement of 98%, and that requires 
requires a lot of other uh, elements. So we are confident in, in those figures and uh, we have also experienced those uh, in, in our early executions and, and the customers would like to have it. So, so this is our story. Mm. Mm. Thank you so much, Thanks. Hampus. Let's move on to our next caller, which is Klaus Berlind City, of course. Klaus, please go ahead. <coughs> Do we have Klaus on the line? Yeah. Please go ahead, Klaus. Um, thank you. Hi, hi, Martin, Jan and Jan. It's Klaus from City. So thanks for a very informative session. So first on, on R&D, um, electric and fuel cell, 35% uh, of new sales by 2030, and then a big ramp to 2040 to be able to have a fossil-free fleet by 2050. How should we think about R&D here, Martin? The, the, the split here between the ICE uh, conventional portfolio and new powertrain peers, do you have, have signal that total R&D can stay flat until 2025, but with a mix shifting to new powertrain, and then we see a, a, a fall in ICE? Um, so if you could comment a little bit on the trajectory there. Yeah, thank you, Klaus. Uh, first and foremost, what we can say, obviously, is that, uh, as you said, we will have a shift in the portfolio of R&D. Because, uh, uh, as Lars said, of course, we will continue to invest in uh, uh, certain of the platforms when it comes to combustion. But at the same time there, we are also pruning and streamlining and getting even better in our cost methodology. We have done a good journey when it comes to really combining forces among all our business areas and have it built up now when it comes to the cost. Uh, that we can also release funds. And then obviously we're shifting into the new technologies of electrification, both battery electric and fuel cell electric. But to a large point also, the, the powertrain as such for electric will, will be uh, similar both for fuel cell and battery. And thereby we can reuse that uh, for, for different type of applications. Uh, so, so I think you should think about it that we are well prepared. And in, on top of that, of course, the fuel cell development as such it is an advantage for the stack development that we are sharing that with, with Daimler, uh, both for the development of the stack, but also for scaling and thereby getting that into the market uh, rather quickly. Because the S-curve here is really about getting the volumes going step by step, and that is also good for R&D. And then we can combine, and I think we have showed that there we, are, uh, we are following pretty well the R&D. Uh, and, and you will not see the similar pattern as you have seen on the uh, pass car side because uh, our R&D portfolio is constituted. But when we feel that we will be a little bit more forward leaning and we can still fulfill uh, our ambitions and, and promises that we have done on the financial targets, we will also do that. So uh, we are flexible in our PNL, following the financial targets and, and also accelerating in, in innovation. Mm -hmm. well, that's good to hear. My, my second one is on Equipment as a service, 50% of the sales by 2030, and coming back to Hampus' question. What is the likely margin impact? Uh, because obviously traditional service, spare parts and so forth, you could see a hit as you're moving away. But your vehicle margin can obviously increase to compensate for that. And I don't think the truck industry in general has been that good at pricing the vehicles before. So are we talking about that offsetting the, the, the service margin hit then? What you can say, first and foremost, what we see on our service margin execution, generally speaking, is a little bit higher than the vehicles. But, but more importantly, of course, that is bringing two very important elements for us that we can optimize. That is the duration stability of services, resilience for the companies, uh, company as such when it comes to absorption. Then you should obviously think about equipment as a service and transport as a service as two parts of the journey up to 50%, uh, because we still have and we have a considerable service business already. And some of that will also, of course, remain and continue to be developed as we have done the last uh, couple of years. So it will continue to be a mix, but generally speaking, service business, higher margins, better resilience, and better uh, uh, customer uh, contacts over the time, and thereby also better retention. So exciting journey. Thank you. Thank you so much, Klaus. We are moving on to our third caller, and that is Daniela Costa from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Do we have Daniela on the line? Hi. 
Uh, good afternoon. Um, sorry, having some issues here with the connection. I think there's a little bit of a lag, and, and apologies if my question has, has been answered. I think it, it actually relates somewhat to the prior question. Uh, but first, uh, I think you mentioned in um, before and in also in the interviews in the morning, vehicle life cycle will increase by um, 40 to 50 percent um, um, in terms of like the revenue opportunity. Um, uh, can can sort of like you elaborate a little bit about the the, the, the financial impacts that this will have and how quickly uh, will will those show through? And I think my second question was somewhat related to the prior one, but I, I didn't listen to everything because of the gap. I think, which is over 50% of service by 2030. That should be very ROIC uh, or, or ROSI accretive. Can you, you said you want to do more from here. Do you have a ROSI ambition, long-term target that you can give, give us some color of? Thank you. <clears throat> no, no, first and foremost, obviously, what we have said that uh, during this growth opportunity, we will continue to to uh, deliver on our financial targets. I mean, this is not a compromise. I mean, perform and transform uh, comes together. So that is the first part. Uh, then when it comes to, to, to services as such, uh, uh, as I just said, it will be a, a constitution. We have already today uh, a rather big and growing service business when it comes to service contracts, when it comes to connected solutions, of course, our financial services. But we will add on then equipment as a service as a very important uh, piece of puzzle. And the reason for that is also that this is what uh, uh, a majority of our customers would like to see in order to make the step change from uh, combustion technology into uh, electrification, uh, both battery and fuel cell electric. And one very important factor of that is also our customers' uh, ambition to gradually moving on from having in-house services that was much more common uh, 20, 30 years ago, and then it has gradually going down. Uh, and now when you are taking this step into high voltage uh, competence, a lot of certificates and other type of requirements, you will further expand that uh, peace of mind uh, sort of story. Uh, so uh, obviously then, uh, with our strong uh, Volvo Financial Services backbone, we will have all the abilities to, to fund that, both through uh, our own portfolio, but also in syndication, the green funding and other things that we have talked about. And I know that a lot of investors are super interesting in that, not at least when the contract length is expanded, so you have a good visibility over time here. And I think, Martin, uh, it's important also what you were into, the contract length, mm. because where we are good is normally the first owner. As we see three to four years, right? Yeah, the service contracts, and now we will get longer mm. relationship in the service side with, with our customers mm. as we see it. Mm. Good. Daniela, any other questions or should we move on? No, thank you very much. Thank you for calling in. And our next caller is Erik Golrang from SCB. Please go ahead, Erik. Thank you. Um, I have three questions. Uh, the first one is on, uh, on the equation of, of, of getting a decent margin also when you include batteries on, on, on trucks. Is, is the whole uh, approach towards sort of end-to-end -end solutions and, and trucking as a service really key in and sort of perhaps hiding the battery cost a bit in there to, to get a margin on there as, as, as well. Uh, and then the second question is, you, you said that e-commerce is breaking the demand curve here for, for truck demand relative underlying GDP. Uh, do you have any sort of numbers to, to put on that? Uh, and then the third question, and I think you partially talked about this previously, but, but uh, is there no of uh, reason or incentive at all to perhaps invest in a proprietary charging network uh, to sort of further accelerate what you say is the, is, is the market leading position there. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> shall I take it or? I can take the third. Mm -hmm. I can start with the first one on the batteries here. I think the good news in our business, uh, Eric, is that it's not uh, necessarily positive to hide anything because we have professional customers. Uh, so, so that's the reason why I had also the session about how this will play out for the customers at the end of the day. Uh, and they are already today counting in their books, uh, either the customer or the customer's customers, how this is playing out as cost per kilometers. Uh, and, and therefore, we are very clear that if you should move into electric, uh, there are certain consequences of that. You're shifting one of your cost pies uh, and decreasing that, um, that is energy cost. Uh, towards uh, the battery. But the, the game for us is obviously to, to provide those four elements as a competitive offering for the customer, 
as regards uh, cost per kilometers, uptime, uh, as regards uh, safety, productivity, uh, fossil free, obviously, and th this peace of mind. And uh, then we will say that this is the cost per kilometer that will be higher, but you will have a good debatement when it comes to uh, the energy prices. And then the shift will happen. And of course, CO2. CO2 free uh, operations will not come for free that uh, we did show here. And the interest of that is super high. Super high. Mm -hmm. Anyone who would like to fill in? No, I can take uh, the question about uh, charging infrastructure. I think when we talk about everything that is around electromobility, a new kind of consulting services, how we optimize the whole vehicle in, in, uh, when it is uh, out there running, uh, there is a lot of things that will happen, including, of course, uh, the charging infrastructure and, and, and all that kind of stuff. I, I think we will we'll probably gradually look into what we need to do, what we want to do, uh, but also, of course, what, what is uh, giving us uh, good returns on the money that we do. I think it's a little bit too, too early days to say exactly what it will be. Uh, we are touching some of these, uh, these areas already today uh, when, when it comes to our venture capital arm as well. So uh, I, I wouldn't say yes to your question. I wouldn't say no either. I think it depends a little bit on it. And as I said, if we can do a good business out of that, we will have absolutely do that. But, but I think to, uh, to Jan's point, what is important to, uh, to understand is that, of course, we have an extensive e ecosystem of that Absolutely. already today, since we have been operating for the bus side, but also now on the medium duty side. So partnerships, partnership is the new leadership. And, and uh, it's not only about the charging infrastructure as such, it's also about permits, it's about the grid capacity. And we have learned a lot here over the last year. So uh, either in-house, but also with partners, the more important is that the solution comes together uh, uh, totally. And when it comes to e-commerce, uh, yes and no, Eric. I, I don't feel ready to give I mean, a more exact figure on that. But what we have seen, and not at least now also, partially explained that we have had, as we said also at the trading update in relation to quarter three, uh, a rather good demand, of course, the catch-up, uh, the underlying demand, but also e-commerce that, of course, have accelerated during this unfortunate situation with the pandemic. But we already did see that before. We are doing some uh, research. I will not say that I'm ready to just pick a number and say uh, the normal underlying gro growth of 3-4%, often related to GDP, has now gone up to something else. But we see uh, indications of how that is happening. But... Uh, uh, and we are convinced that it is happening, but uh, I will not just pick a number because that is not fair. We can leave that as a cliffhanger for later. Yeah. Thank you so much, Eric for, Eric, for joining us today. Our next caller is Tom Narayan from RBC. Please go ahead and share your questions with us, Tom. Uh, yes, thank you, Tom Narayan, RBC. Thanks for taking the questions. I really have two questions on uh, fuel cells. The first one is, you know, we, we hear an issue that is a bottleneck for making fuel cells that it will likely require costly platinum. As we understand it, platinum can be recouped from recycling scrap catalytic converters and ICE cars is one possible solution. You know, what are your thoughts on this apparent key issue facing widespread commercialization of fuel cell vehicles? And the second one is, you know, you sell um, fuel cells produced with your JV with Daimler to, um, w will you sell them w to other OEMs? Or is it only just for the, the two of you? Just curious because we know suppliers who are planning on making fuel cells as well. And typically suppliers are better positioned and they can achieve better scale economics. But trucks obviously is a very consolidated market. So perhaps this isn't as big of a problem for you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Maybe, Lars, you would like to start? I can start, Rick, as I said, and that uh, as late as this week, uh, Monday, we signed the binding contract together with Daimler then, and we are then still formally awaiting then, uh, the, or the formal uh, clearance from uh, uh, competition authorities before we really get started. Uh, so before we dive too deep into to the technologies, we need to get started. Uh, but definitely then, we have done a very thorough uh, due diligence together with Daimler regarding the technologies that they have been working on so far and the intention going forward, our shared intention going forward. And that includes, of course, all kind of catalytic materials mm. that we will use. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, we have done a thorough due diligence. We have a good plan, including what kind of catalytic materials we, we're going to use. I think I leave it like that for today. 
Mm. Martin, would you like to fill in? No, maybe just to add that, I mean, of course, when we talked about the fossil free roadmap laws uh, up to uh, 2050, then today we talked about the tailpipe emissions, but in order to be uh, truly fossil free there, and that is also included in our journey, we are talking about also what we are bringing on board and how we are producing that. Uh, so so uh, obviously that is a very good, valid and uh, relevant question that we will together address. Uh, on the second note, uh, the whole setup is based on uh, that we will have a joint venture 50-50 that is delivering fuel cell stacks out of that, uh, providing uh, Daimler and, and Volvo. Uh, but we have already signed an agreement with Rolls-Royce and their power generation unit of also providing stacks uh, to them. Uh, so, so the answer to that is, of course, yes, we believe firmly with our volume capabilities that we can create the necessary scale technology uh, and, and thereby making it competitive also for uh, other uh, uh, takers of these stacks because it will be a vast range of utilization, not at least when it comes now with the renewable generation of energy, wind, solar, where uh, there are, as you know, certain hours during the night, for example, when energy prices are low and you need to store that energy, where hydrogen will play a very important role. Uh, so, um, uh, super exciting about that. Thank you Thank so you. much, Tom. Uh, our next caller is Björn Enarsson, and he's calling from Danske Bank. Uh, Björn, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I have one question on uh, another mega trend. I mean, we are talking, of, uh, of course, a lot about uh, moving into more sustainable technologies. But I mean, looking in, in the car industry, I, I would assume that the change into a smarter vehicle is uh, an even bigger and perhaps even more complex uh, transition. Uh, I would uh, like you to comment on that. And uh, uh, as vehicles are becoming smarter and fully connected, uh, do you have the ambition to, to run this, uh, I mean, uh, a global network uh, for vehicles and to maintain and develop that? Is that the core, basically, to have an own operating system, etc.? Is this a, a big uh, focus area for you? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe to start with, uh, I mean, uh, we can add on here, but when it comes to the whole story of connected solutions, of course, that is a key cornerstone because the whole uh, abilities that digitalization will bring is already serving us very much today in our relations with the customers, but also in our own operation. We have more than 1.3 uh, million connected units today where we are optimizing a lot of things and gradually moving, as you call it, to more and more smart and intelligent solutions, optimizing that through uh, AI and others. Uh, for example, truck monitoring, where we can really predict how the durability look like, uh, the uptime, etc. Uh, then step by step, of course, we will move into the real smart solutions when we have autonomous solutions. Uh, that was touched upon and that will also be done in steps because in many cases for example in our applications like in mining ports you want at the first step just to remove humans out from uh, the operate, uh, operational spot and then you can use that co connectivity platform uh, for, for operating remotely and then as Neil said also already next year now we are commercializing fully autonomous solutions. So, so here we have a global platform Absolutely. And, and we have a, a business a unit, a Volvo Group Connected Solutions that is running that backbone platform for all the different business areas very successfully. So uh, building on that will be the key for, for the future. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Björn. Uh, our next caller is Nikolai Kempf and he's calling from Deutsche Bank. Nikolai, please go ahead. Yes, I'm here. Uh, yes, there's Nikolai speaking from Deutsche Bank. Thank you for taking my question. So my first one would be in cost parity. When do you expect the cost parity between the electric versus the diesel truck, given that the diesel truck will likely become more expensive while the electric truck will become cheaper? And the second question would be in battery cells. You have a cooperation with Samsung battery cells. Given the importance of the battery sir, what is your strategy to secure enough batteries and also the competitive price? Thank you. Yeah, if I, if I start with the, with the TCO parity, Nikolai, I think what is important to understand here is, of course, that the TCO or enough 
close TCO parity, since I mean the whole story also for the customers and customers' customers in many cases, as I showed here on the distribution case, will actually be to get the CO2 also, because today many uh, customers, all customers' customers are paying also to abate the CO2, offsetting CO2 that they have, and of course it will feel much better to do it yourself. Uh, so, so that has also, so to speak, a revenue impact. Uh, so uh, already here and now you have close enough TCO parity in, uh, in quite many segments that will shift. And that's the reason why we talk about these S-curves, that when that is happening, the transformation and the shift will go rather quick for that, uh, for that segment and that geography. And it will not be a one size fits all over time. And the winners clearly here, that is often missed, is that can deliver for each specification and geography when that TCO parity is clear enough or close enough and then transform quickly and get the volumes. Uh, and uh, uh, we are excited about that, uh, uh, that type of transformation because we think that is uh, fitting us uh, rather well. Mm -hmm. Then when it comes to the parameters of uh, batteries. Well, uh, regarding the availability and capacity of batteries, I think this is exactly the reason why we are talking about a partnership where you have two partners working extremely close together and we are then sitting planning the future together regarding the needed capacity and availability of batteries then. And uh, regarding attractive prices uh, to bonus then, it's the same thing there. A partnership um, is constituted by um, two partners that need to stay attractive. That's how we keep uh, the partnership alive. Very good. Thank you so much, Nikolai. Uh, let's move on to our next caller, and that is Himanshu Agarwal from calling in from Jeffries. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, Himan Shugarwal from Jeffries. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking my questions. I have two. Um, I just want to understand, for every fossil-free vehicle that you sell, you don't sell an ICE vehicle. So with an accelerated adoption of fossil-free vehicles, how should we think about the depreciation on ICE assets? And is there a risk of write-downs there? And secondly, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on a long haul BEV truck. Uh, I presume from the slides, I didn't see one. Um, what do you think of a long haul BEV truck with a range of around 500 kilometers? Given the tachograph regulation, I think it could cater to a wide range of application and possibly reduce your time to market as well. Thank you. Uh, uh, very quick on the last one. I, I'm not sure that. I didn't hear it. No, um, did we get the first question? Oh, uh, no. may, can we repeat the first question? Mm. Yeah, so first question was around the accelerated adoption of fossil free vehicles could lead to higher depreciation on your ICE assets and possibly some write downs because of low volume. Okay. Uh, no, uh, if, if, I, if we start with uh, uh, that one, uh, as Jens explained also, I think we are, we are well placed when it comes to our assets today, both when it comes to, so to speak, what is the book value of it, but more importantly, what is the value moving mm. forward. And, and that's the reason why we are uh, confident that by using the, the Fishbone principle, uh, step by step implementing and co-hosting both battery electric and and other type of vehicles into the same lines will, will solve that uh, largely. Uh, if there are uh, some write-downs, it could be related a little bit uh, further down the road, uh, but it's not material at all uh, when it comes to the component manufacturing. Because as we said that we have the competence needed also for other uh, types. So it's not the material write-down needed as we see it. And the good news is that we will not have to create new factories or platforms that will take a long time to actually ramp up volumes. That is also a big difference from, from past cars, obviously. Uh, so uh, here we are agile enough to, sh to, to shift when, when that is happening. And just to be very clear on your last question, yes, uh, we agree uh, when it comes to what we call regional haul or long haulage coming back. Uh, uh, during the night, for example, 500 kilometers or something that it will be well fitted for battery electric and for even longer it will be fuel cell electric. So uh, that is the reason actually why we are introducing now already next year the heavy duty applications. That was not shown here, but uh, the vehicle standing in the room here is a such vehicle that you are uh, after that we will introduce next year for sales.
what, what you could add, of course, uh, Martin, related to the question around impairment. Of course, if with these plans we have shown today, there is no risk of impairment. Otherwise, we would have done it already mm -hmm. uh, since we have the plans. But it's also, I think, more, more uh, important for us is also to... Uh, be very diligent in the investments going forward because, as uh, Lars said, I mean, 10 years from now, still a Absolutely. big part of, of what we are doing is still be related to diesel. So there we have to be uh, careful when we are sort of allocating, ca allocating capital going forward. Hmm. All right, very good. Uh, Himan Shu, thank you so much for joining us today. Our next caller is Jo Odia, Vertical Research Group. Please go ahead, Jo. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, a few questions. First, I was just hoping for a, a breakdown of when you talk about 35% penetration of EV, just to clarify that that's both a combination of the commercial vehicle and the construction side of things. And can you give a sense of how you think that looks in Europe versus North America versus Asia PAC? And then second question is, um, when you talk about over 50% of revenues from services and solutions in 2030, and that's in a world with 35% going to EV, when you think about 100% EV, what do you think about the mix of services and solutions revenues um, being? And then third question is just what you think of the subsidy environment today? Do you, do you see enough out there to support the kind of adoption that you're looking at over the next 10 years? Thank you. Who would like to begin? Shall I take it or sure. uh, if we start with, uh, I mean, uh, how it will play out, obviously, as we said, it's both uh, from a regional perspective. And there you correctly mentioned regions that we think are uh, uh, very early out when it comes to this adoption. Uh, Europe, uh, North America, or at least parts of North America, like California, for example. Uh, we see China, Japan, uh, parts of Southeast Asia, like Singapore. Uh, urban areas also in, in other parts of the world. Uh, but the most important, as we said, is also the shift uh, from uh, segment to segment, uh, because the TCO parity and uh, TCO parity, including, the, so to speak, the CO2 abatement will, will also play out here. Uh, so, so that is how we see it, and that's the reason why Jens also showed the importance of having the industrial footprint ready, because very rarely people are asking themselves who can scale this. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, not only, so to speak, the, the, the vehicle, but the, the whole system and also the services. Uh, then what was it? Uh, what will happen when the penetration goes above 35% of the yeah. metric? What will happen with the service part? Yeah, I mean, uh, th this is, of course, uh, uh, when we are looked upon this, uh, this is included uh, the electric vehicle penetration. Yeah. But it's also a, a constantly including the continuous uh, penetration increase that we've had also in our ordinary service business. And also to, I think it was, uh, was it Eric's questions about connected solutions that we're also now penetrating more and more. So this is a continuous uh, game. But when we are going uh, upwards from the 35%, that share will increase because mm -hmm. equipment as a service uh, is, uh, I mean, equipment as a service. And then also we have the acceleration of autonomous uh, uh, towards the later part of uh, the decade. So, yeah. And finally, the subsidy environment. Mm. Yeah, I, th I think the subsidy environment uh, uh, partly is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, supporting. We have seen a number of cases uh, like that. I think the more importance is the consistency uh, over time uh, and not at least also, uh, you will see that also in urban areas, for example, that it will be restrictions on what you, you can actually drive into different cities that will also play out. Uh, but as we go along now, the, the TCO parity, including CO2, will be the main driver uh, to, to gain volumes. And, and as we see it also, electricity will be uh, cheaper and cheaper given the big built out of renewables uh, and also the hydrogen economy. Very good. Thank you, Joe, Joe for, for being with us today. That was, in fact, our last caller. So, guys, it's time to wrap this up. First and foremost, thank you, everyone, for watching the 2020 Capital Markets Day. Uh, again, all the material is available and the entire broadcast on volvogroup.com. Pl please stay safe and join us next time we have the opportunity. And finally, Martin, would you like to do a short conclusion? No, I think everyone 
would like that to be a short conclusion. First and foremost, also from my side and management, uh, big thank you for uh, being with us uh, today. Uh, and hope also that you have found uh, our messages about uh, performing from a uh, position of strength and also transforming into this uh, new exciting uh, world of transportation. And hope also, of course, that you will be part of our journey for the future. Uh, so looking forward to that. We are the Volvo Group.